<laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so I'm Steve Jones. Uh, I grew up in Naugatuck, or as we say, Naugatuck. <laughs> Naugatuck High School, Naugatuck Town Hall, Naugatuck Town, yeah. Anyway, I'm saying it enough. Uh, but I'm living in Naperville, Illinois right now. So I've been researching this project six, five, six years now. Um, my main interest is uh, insulator collecting. Um, when I, well, I was born in Mount Kisco, New York. Don't tell anyone over here. <laughs> when we were 10, my grandfather died, so we got the property in his house in Naugatuck. So we moved to Naugatuck where my father grew up, and we've been here since 1640. So I'm part of the dirt here, not New York, though I still have the eh from the accent. Uh, <laughs> so no one knows where I'm from, depending on what side of the state line I'm on. Uh, anyway, so we had four acres of woods. My great-grandfather had 100 acres of woods, which was undeveloped, so naturally my brother and I, you know, 10 and 8, we start getting out there and start building paths and forts and tree houses. And uh, from the age of three, I discovered I wanted to be a lineman, first for Con Ed and then for CLMP once we moved over here. So I'm like, oh, I can put up poles. So I started putting up my own poles, which then required me to get insulators somehow. And then I kind of fell into the insulator hobby in 1981. I joined the Yankee Polecat Insulator Club. <laughs> it was in Sandy Hook at the time. Um, the nation's oldest insulator club, 1971. Or 1970, sorry. We just had a show up in Enfield Sunday, so I come, I drive out for that. And then the talk, we mat matched up the dates so I could do the talk here while I was here. Um, so yeah, I started putting on my own poles and I knew a bunch of linemen and I had street lights and everyone kept saying, Charlie, why are your woods lit up up there? <laughs> no idea. So, so yeah, um, I went to be a lineman, got to college, three years of electrical engineering in Western New England up in Springfield. After discovering I hate math, I switched to industrial engineering. Uh, and ultimately, I wound up in occupational safety and ergonomics. So I'm actually the ergonomist for Ecolab out of uh, Chicago, Naperville, Illinois. So uh, I get to travel the world for that. Uh, but I still collect insulators, and I'm still very interested, of course, here. Not Megger, from heritage, even if not birth. Uh, and I love the, the, the history of all this early electrical power development. So Bulls Bridge, uh, as we'll see, was one of the big ones at the time. So um, I originally did this talk twice over in Washington for Gun Museum. The town of Washington has been obsessed with this power line because it ran through Washington originally. And it was very, it was, uh, had a lot of notoriety at the time. It was a cutting edge project when they put it in, but it's disappeared. And they're like, where's the, for, where's the, I've got letters going back to 1960 to CLP from the town. Where's this power line? We can't find it. <laughs> so I found it, so boom. <laughs> Gun wanted me, so I did two talks for them in the last three years. So anyway, um, before we dive into Bulls Bridge, I'm going to go a little bit into the history of hydroelectric power, especially in Connecticut, just to kind of set up how grand this project up the river here was when it was built in 1902, 1904. Um, so, anyway, I'm going to refer to my notes a little bit here. Um, we know New England was the center for the Industrial Revolution, early 1800s. We stole some technology off the British and opened up our own factories and equipment and machinery. Uh, in New England in particular, we have long flowing rivers, lots of drops in elevation, very easy to put up a water wheel, and operate early equipment, grinding wheels, machines, and so forth. Um, so we lent ourselves very much to that, our geography and our terrain. So when electricity was discovered and became practical in the late 1870s, early 1880s, it was very easy to take the next leap, take, you know, uh, put a set up a dynamo to generate direct current, or DC, off these water wheels, and operate early motors, or particularly lights, carbon arc lights, the first form of electric lighting. Um, so uh, that, those projects started to take off in the late 1870s. People started wanting this. Um, so the first instance, um, the first hydroelectric project in Connecticut that got any national notoriety was over in Willimantic, the Willimantic Linen Company. The mill buildings are still over there now. Um, <coughs> Willimantic Linen Company was owned by Austin Dunham, and his son A.C. Dunham was just enthralled with this hydroelectric technology. Electricity, I want, I want electricity. So I'm sure he convinced his father to put a dynamo on their existing water wheel in Willimantic, and they set up six carbon arc lights to electrically light the mill. When they did that, they became the first linen mill on the planet to be electrically lit. So that got a lot of notoriety in its time. 
1878. So, uh, in fact, that experiment was so well received that the next year, 1879, when the state was celebrating the anniversary of the Battle of Antietam, which was known as Battle Flag Day in Connecticut, designated by the General Assembly, <laughs> they borrowed those arc lights and they put them on the Capitol building for a public display of illumination. And they actually took one of the lights, put it on the Plimpton building, I don't know if that still stands or not, but they turned it into a floodlight and they would aim it around during this celebration. So there's news accounts of the time, you know, young couples would be getting cozy, <laughs> and also it's a floodlight time, you hear a scream. <laughs> so the young couples didn't like lighting, but everyone was good. Uh, and there was also another account, someone was on Talcott Mountain in Simsbury, nine miles away, and they said they could read a book by the light of that arc light on the Flinton building. So of course that, wow, this is, Great, so sold the technology very quickly. Um, so, A.C. Dunham became president of a new startup company, brand new company called Hartford Electric Light in about 1880. Uh, Hartford Electric Light had a small steam generator at their Pearl Street station in downtown Hartford, and they had a few carbon arc lights out and about. Um, they were trying to grow the business, compete against Hartford Gas Light Company for the street lighting contracts in Hartford. Uh, but steam power is extremely expensive to operate, maintain, and install. So they couldn't really drop their rates. They had a high rate for this electricity, so they didn't win a lot of customers. So AC comes along and says, well, hey, we used hydropower in Willimantic. We need hydropower for Hartford Electric Light. And of course, being a small company, no capital, they said, well, we can't build a dam. We, we have no means of doing this. So AC turned to a college buddy of his, Edward Terry, from Yale. Edward was the grandson of Eli Terry, the clockmaker from Terryville, Bristol there. Uh, so they put together $20,000 and they bought some land up along the river in Windsor on the Farmington River in the Rainbow section, then referred to as Oil City. Um, that area is kind of across from where Bradley Airport is now. That's still called the Rainbow section there. Uh, but it was called Oil City because there was an oil swindle there several years earlier. Someone apparently took oil, poured it on the rocks along the river, and said, hey, there's oil here. <laughs> <laughs> they sold land for about a year until they got chased out of town and thrown in jail. <laughs> the land was spooked. No one wanted it. So they swooped in and they purchased $20,000 worth of land uh, right there in Rainbow. Uh, so they apparently brought in some lumberjacks from Maine. They threw up a woodlog dam, built a wooden powerhouse. They named the outfit Farmington River Power Company. And they generated 500 volts DC, shipped it 10 miles down to Hartford, and Helco became the purchaser of that electricity. So once they did that, Helco could lower their rates, and then gradually they built the business. They got all the street lighting contracts. In fact, they said Hartford was the first all electrically lit city in the United States by 1890? Somewhere, or no, 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 uh, 1895 or 97, somewhere in there, before 1900. Uh, so, first in the United States, all electrically lit. Um, so Elko started to take off. Um, so it was direct current DC, 500 volts. Uh, within two years, alternating current came on the scene. Nikola Tesla was doing all his crazy experiments with the generators and Faraday cages and throwing lightning across the air and frightening everyone. Uh, but he developed something called polyphase alternating current. Now, you, you, uh, a dynamo generates direct current a generator generates alternating current. The advantage of alternating current is you can step up or down the voltage using a transformer. So you can regulate the voltage. DC, not so much. Um, so he developed AC power, but three phase, what we today call three phase. So if you look at the power lines out here, there's three wires on the top, that's three phase power. We use that commonly every day now. Uh, he developed that concept. So uh, a company out of Boston, uh, Thompson Houston, swooped in to Farmington River Power and said, hey, how would you like it if we set up a three-phase generator and tinker it around with it a little bit? Mm -hmm. said, okay, great. So they formulated this project to upgrade Rainbow Plant. Um, they actually sent a professor from Trinity College over to Laufen, Germany, where they were experimenting with three-phase power and built an experimental power line. They were already designing it. Our professor goes over there, and he's taking notes <laughs> and observations gets back to Farmington, or Windsor, and they build the system that he copied off Laufen. So we built the world's first three-phase generating station 
at Rainbow of Farmington River Power, and then I ran a three-phase line down to Hartford Electric Light at 5,000 volts. So we became the first to build a three-phase system, a utility on a commercial scale. Um, but it's kind of shameful because we copied it off of Germany, so we don't really talk about it in public. <laughs> but the Farmington, right there in Windsor, first three-phase. Now there were single-phase alternating current generators. The first one's out in Ames, Colorado, out by Telluride. Uh, that plant, which is still there and is still operating, uh, that ran, um, I forget what, 2,500 volts, one phase, single circuit, uh, up five miles to the Gold King mine above Telluride. When they did that, they, the reason they did that, one of the reasons, uh, at Westinghouse set that up. Uh, they, back in the days, in order to operate equipment, you burned wood or you burned coal to turn a steam generator, then you know, turn motors and uh, all that, steam, steam engines and things like that. Well, they had cut down all the trees in Colorado. So they were running out. And plus, wood doesn't burn real well at 10,000 feet. Um, so they developed this out of necessity, and they ran a power line five miles up the Gold King Mine, and it greatly dropped the price of mining and processing gold and silver when they did that. So that was 1891. This was 1893. This was the world's first three-phase <coughs> installation. Um, kind of about the same time, over in Norwich, uh, the Ponema Mills, the building's still there, they're turning it into apartments. That was the world's largest linen mill at one point. They wanted to use electricity just like they saw Hartford Electric Light was using electricity and Willimantic Linen, one of their competitors. So they said, well, we need a motor and a generator, or a dynamo. So they installed a dynamo three miles upstream of the Chautauqua in the Baltic Mill, and they ran it. Uh, I think 2,500 volt DC line down to Ponema Mills uh, and then used it in the mill there in Taftville. And they had a motor which still drew, uh, drove all the belts and pulleys to operate the looms and stuff. So just the motor turned that shaft instead of the water wheel. Uh, so they did that 1893-ish. Uh, the problem with DC direct current is you can't transmit it very far before it burns up in the wire. Uh, like AC, you can step up the voltage and shoot it further. DC, you couldn't do that. Once you generated it, that's it. Um, the other problem with DC is that you can't regulate the voltage. So when the Chautauqua River would get real low at the end of summer, the water wheel would turn slower, the dynamo would, dynamo would turn slower, the voltage on the line would drop. So the looms down at Ponema Mills would speed up and slow down as the water went up and down in the Chautauqua, which of course drove them crazy. <laughs> so they said enough of this after a year. So General Electric, another startup company out of Pittsfield, came in and said, hey, we can set up a three-phase generator for you, too. They were the competitor to Thompson Houston before they ended up buying them. Um, so they set up a three-phase system in 1894 over in Taftville, and so they solved that problem with the looms there. So that was another nationally um, recognized and famous hydro project when that went in. So we had two in the state. Um, so anyway, Helco's uh, profits got big enough years later. By 1896, they built their own dam further up on the Farmington in the Tariffville section of Simsbury. That came online in 1899. That became world famous because it was the first transmission line <coughs> down to Hartford at 11,000 volts, three-phase AC. First transmission line to use aluminum cables. Everyone else used copper or even iron. They used aluminum. They were the first to do that. So another first for Connecticut at that point in time. So that was a big uh, success. So of course everyone's looking at these projects around the state, especially over here, Litchfield County on the Housatonic, just sitting there flowing. And they're like, well if they can do it in Hartford and Windsor, how come we can't do it here? So the first project built on the Housatonic was Bulls Bridge, right here in 1903-1904, came online. Um, next was Berkshire Power up in Canaan, which is a smaller plant. Uh, what came online, uh, it was chartered in 1904. They strung the wires, it said, this is the account, strung the wires in the middle of winter of 1906. So it only served the towns up there. Um, Norfolk, North Canaan, Canaan, Sharon, and Salisbury. Small project, it only lasted a few years and a flood took it out. All right, that was the second one. Uh, third one was Falls Village, which is still there, built in 1914. That was Connecticut Power Company, which was not in this area, they were in Middletown. So all the electricity went to Middletown from that dam. Um, before they were bought out by NU, of course. Uh, so we have Falls Village, and then Rocky River, closer to New Milford here, was chartered in 1917, and they had some ups and downs. I've heard there was none, there's no clear history I've been able to find on this. 
They tinkered with the dam, I heard, but then can't find any documentation. Their big project, though, is what's in there now. Um, they built uh, the Rocky River Power Plant, uh, came online in 1928. It was a pumped storage plant, which means you pull water out of the river at night, you pump it uphill into a basin. That basin is now Candlewood Lake, and they let it flow down by daytime, turns the turbines, and generates electricity. So when they built that and it came online in 1928, that was the first in the United States, pump storage, second on the planet. There was one in Switzerland at that time, that's it. So another first for Connecticut utility. Uh, and then finally, when CLMP formed, a few years later, they built Stevenson Dam down there in Monroe in Oxford. That came online in 1919, formed Lake Zor. And then they built the Chapaw Dam in Southbury here, forming Lake Lilanona in 1955. So six active projects just on the Housatonic, just in Connecticut alone, and there were several more up in Massachusetts as well. So it's a very well-utilized river for hydropower. Uh, and five of those are still operating today. As I said, Berkshire Power's gone, the rest of them are still operating. So that's pretty profound. So anyway, we're going to focus on Bulls Bridge since that's the subject of the talk. <coughs> so Nick, um, Bulls Bridge was first envisioned by a gentleman named Nicholas Staub. He had immigrated from Germany in the late 1850s, I believe, and very quickly became a local then state politician, I believe as a state senator, and then became state controller. So he became pretty well known, especially in this area uh, at that point. So he had a vision, he says, well, if everyone else is doing this, we need electricity in New Milford as well, so we need to build a dam. So he gets a, a buddy of his, Isaac Bristol, and they start lobbying the General Assembly. So they get a charter in 1893, same year as Farmington River Power, uh, that created New Milford Power Company and gave them, quote, power to acquire all such land that was needed or, where am I, necessary or convenient uh, with the use of water power on the Housatonic River at or near Bulls Falls, Gaylord Bridge, and Lover's Leap. So that's a long stretch of river. That's a pretty broad charter, especially for that era. Um, so they were given that right uh, in 1893. So they start lobbying to build a dam, try to raise money, and you know, Yankee pocketbooks at that time were very tight. So, and I think there was a financial panic or two in that time also. So they didn't get any money to build their project. Uh, so it kind of languished on the back burner until about 1900. Uh, another local gentleman, Walter Scott Morton, was backed by a company out of Philadelphia, United Gas and Improvement, which was kind of the only company, kind of like speculators, so they had money and they started, it's kind of like Shark Tank, I guess, they start throwing money at these projects. Uh, so they gave Walter Scott the money to buy out Nicholas Staub and Isaac Bristol. So finally, they can start building the project. So they start surveying it and building in the spring of 1902. And it came online uh, around March 1904. So the project itself was a pretty huge project. It was a massive project. They built the dam up there right above Bulls Bridge, the covered bridge up there in Kent. Uh, and to get enough water pressure to turn a turbine for the amount of power they wanted generated, they had to run the canal, run a canal level two miles south of that dam. And of course it's still there, you probably, you're local, you probably know all about that. Uh, they ran the canal two miles down uh, to the Four Bay up here, right just above Gaylordsville. And there's a gatehouse sitting on top of that. And then it goes down a pipe uh, penstock pipe down into the plant. So that's a 115 foot drop. So that gave them enough pressure to turn a turbine to generate enough electricity. I think the initial capacity of that plant was six megawatts. So that's, at the time, that was a scary amount of electricity. Uh, so these are just some pictures I found um, from the original construction. And there was also an upgrade done in 1912. Um, and I got some photos from that book as well. So I believe these are both from the initial construction. Uh, this is up in the canal. I don't know what that is. If that's scaffolding or a frame or they're dumping rocks in the canal, well, I, I don't know what that was for. Um, I did read several accounts that that canal up by the dam leaked like a sieve for the first five years. So they had to line it with clay, drain it, line it with clay. Uh, then I think in the 30s or 40s they lined it with gunite, cement, like what they do with swimming pools with, uh, to stop the leaks. So two miles, that's a long canal, especially with that much water. Uh, so I think that's some framework there to drop rocks or at least firm up the bottom of the canal, try to plug up any holes. Uh, then this on the right, this is the power plant being built. 
Uh, this is the back side, so the river's down here. So the pipes come from behind the plant down the hill. And the, here's the uh, penstock pipe across the back, gradually shrinking in size. And it hits the, um, what looks like a smokestack, but they call it the surge tower. Uh, so when you have got that much water coming down a pipe, and they have to trip the plant off for some reason, if you just shut off the water, you're going to get what's called water hammer. Like the pressure is going to build, 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 crack the pipe, and then explode. So you have to keep that water going somewhere. So they switch the valve, run it through this pipe, and then it shoots out the top of that stack until the pressure equalizes, and then they can go about doing what they need to do in the plant. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, when I first did the talk up at Gunn three years ago. Uh, someone who worked at the plant was there, and he said, yeah, you need to be there when it comes out the top. Because someone had asked, is that a chimney? Can they run that steam plant if they need to? It's like, no, 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 no. Just, that's just for water pressure. <coughs> Balance the water pressure. So anyway, that's a picture of them building it. You see all these people on the scaffold building the roof and all that. Like I said, I'm a safety engineer. I don't see anyone tied off. <laughs> 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 Uh, workers comp, first workers comp law, I think it was 1910 in Wisconsin, so yes, yeah, before that. Um, anyway, uh, so here's a project drawing, it's not to scale, but this shows the scope of the whole project. So the dam up here uh, by the covered bridge, and then the two mile long canal, um, and then the four bay here, and then there's the actual powerhouse at the very bottom there. So that's just a rough drawing just to give the scale of this. That's from the 1912 uh, upgrade, uh, book about the 1912 upgrade. Uh, here, because the, their house, the lady who wrote the book uh, about this upgrade, is actually her family history, and her grandfather apparently was the project engineer, the chief project engineer on this project, uh, and uh, the last name was Dakin. I'm on the wrong notes here. Uh, his last name was Dakin, so their farm was right there originally, so he grew up there, so of course he wanted to work on that project when he got older. Uh, so it went right through their farm when they did that. <laughs> Um, so that was the old, that just gives the scope of the project there. On the right here, this is the 1912 upgrade. They put in a second penstock pipe and a second generator in the plant. They increased the capacity from six megawatts to eight megawatts. Um, and this is them hand digging the uh, ditch to put the foundations in to hold the pipe. So they went down about 10 feet, and we all know what it's like to dig in the soil in New England. Three inches bedrock. So I can't even. There must have been more bad backs into Milford in 1904 to 1912 than anywhere else. Uh, so all being handed up here just gives you the just gives you an appreciation for how much work went into that yeah. dam. So there's the gatehouse at the four bay, and there's uh, the primitive Route Seven there with a very strong wood guardrail. <laughs> uh, here's a view. Someone was standing on the powerhouse, hopefully again with fall protection. <laughs> The foundations are in, and they're getting ready to put the second pipe in next to that. And again, there's the four bay up there. Um, and there's a lot of fill dirt here. There's a power line ran right up the middle of that. I don't know where that went, but uh, they're not moving that power line for any reason. Um, <laughs> that just shows how big the scope was. You know, I, mean, I don't know how, I don't know what the diameter of those pipes were. It's at least four or five feet. Uh, so they're big pipes. This is a, a random photo, again, from uh, the 1912 upgrade. I think this might have been 1903, though. It doesn't exactly say what they're doing, but based on what I can see, uh, here's a pole with a cross arm. There's a single piece steel brace uh, at the time, and they've got a chain around that cross arm, and they've got block and tackle pulleys here, and a pallet or something, and they're just throwing rocks on this pallet to test how strong that cross arm brace is, I guess, because the next photo next to it shows the cross arm like this, <laughs> and the brace is still there, and said the bolt has been sheared or broken off. Oops. I don't, there's no scale on that. I'm an engineer, I need numbers. I don't see any numbers on that. So it's just like, it's 323 rocks strong. <laughs> I thought that was just a humorous photo that she included in the book. Uh, this is the this is a completed shot of the powerhouse in 1904. Um, here's the power line, single penstock, single surge tower. Nice, brand new. Everything's nice and shiny and white. Um, and then here's the power line running up the hill uh, to Waterbury. Um, and we know it's 1903, 1904 because one, there's one surge tower and one pipe. But two, um, the power line. I try to blow it up. You can just see kind of like a glint of sunshine and very large glass insulators. So the original line used glass insulators. 
So we know that was early 1904. Uh, this is something my grandmother cut out everything when she was alive. Any newspaper article is in a scrapbook somewhere in the attic. So I've got most of it. My brother's got the rest of it. Um, so this was in there. Uh, the Golden Jubilee of the Bulls Bridge plant, 50 years old, so it must have been 1954. I don't know what paper that came out of. I assume the Waterbury paper, maybe the Nuggetuck paper. Um, but uh, I would love to get an original of that photo because it's taken the same basic view, but you're in the middle of the power line and it's running up the hill uh, there. So I just happened to find that in her albums and albums and albums of newspaper articles. You should see her file on the 55 flood. I got them all if you want them. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is another photo from another newspaper article she had. I don't know why. Uh, this looks like it was taken maybe in the 30s or 40s. Because the second pipe's there, everything kind of looks grown up. Uh, the original power line's gone. So I don't know. But interesting. All right, so anyway, back to Bulls Bridge, the construction here. Um, so Nicholas Staub wanted New Milford to have electricity. That was his vision. Uh, Walter Scott Morton and UGI had a slightly different vision for the electricity, especially if you're going to build a power plant that big, six megawatts, uh, to get a good return on your money, ASAP, you need big customers to sell to. To sell to New Milford, you would have to build the electrical grid from scratch, and that would take years. And apparently Walter didn't have patience. So UGI is like, my, where's my money? So they, they went out and they looked for big customers. Uh, they found one in the New England Line Company here in Gaylordsville. They had a quarry. I know there's still a quarry there. I think it's ONG. I don't know if they mined lime there, but there was New England Line Company. They were there. They subscribed for some electricity right off the bat. So they built a 6,000 volt line down there from Bulls Bridge in 1903 to 4. Uh, but um, over in Waterbury, there was a company, the Connecticut Railway and Lighting Company, which was a consortium. It was an agglomeration of a whole bunch of the local trolley systems in the Nogtuck Valley and also New Britain and Cheshire and Southington. Uh, they all combined into Connecticut Railway and Lighting about two years earlier, uh, and they were running steam generating plants to generate the electricity for the trolleys, which is, like I said, very expensive to build, maintain, and operate. So very low profit margins. They want more money. So they start looking over here. Oh, hey, hydroelectricity is coming up. So they contact New Milford Power, and New Milford Power responds. And they subscribed for, uh, I think it was 2 megawatts. At the time, they called it 3,000 horsepower. This is the era between the scientific community going between imperial and metric measurements. So every article is in a different measurement system. So it's, I had to calculate. So it's 2 megawatts of electricity, 3,000 horsepower. Uh, and they... Um, they subscribed for that amount of electricity off Bulls Bridge Dam so that they could lower their cost, uh, their electricity generation rates, of course. <coughs> but, uh, let's see. So, New Milford Power had a couple large customers. Uh, there was also a line that ran up towards Kent, and we don't know where that went. It didn't go to Kent. None of the local towns were being serviced <coughs> by this dam. It was going to large customers. So, it was CRNL and the line company and someone up in Kent. So, we don't know who. Uh, but that was it, initially off that bridge, uh, off that uh, Bulls Bridge power plant. So, <coughs> New Milford Power had a large customer, 26 miles away over in Waterbury. Now, these days, building a power line 26 miles long is a walk in the park, no big deal. I mean, electricity from New Milford probably comes from one of the dams or maybe from Millstone 3 across the state. You know, not a big deal. But in 1904, 26 miles was a huge engineering problem. There were only a couple projects in place by that point uh, that were in this, um, this scope, this kind of project scope. Um, so when they built the line, uh, they picked 33,000 volts, 33,500 volts for the line over that 26 mile distance. Now then is now, there's a rule in electrical engineering, a uh, rule of thumb, that for every mile of transmission line you have, you need at least 1,000 volts potential to make sure the electricity is going to get where it's supposed to go and not burn up in the resistance. So for 26 miles, that meant they needed a voltage of 26,000 volts minimum. So they picked 33.5. We don't know why. Um, so they said there were a few projects in place out west that were already in that range, brand new projects. 
uh, Bay County's project out in California, the Sierra Nevada, they had two dams and they shipped electricity at 44,000 volts down to Sacramento and then a year or two later down to San Francisco. Uh, that, was one of the, that was the biggest project in North America when they built that in 1901, 1902. Uh, there was a project in Provo, Utah, the Salt Lake Valley at 40,000 volts from the mountains down to Provo. Uh, and then Missouri River Power up in uh, Montana uh, at Great Falls, they had a dam and they shipped electricity down to Helena, about 40 miles. Uh, but then they built a 70 mile power line down to uh, Butte, to all the mines in Butte, at 50,000 volts, which was an insane voltage at that time. It just Highest voltage line when they built that on the planet. Uh, so those were in place a year or two earlier. Not exactly performing well, but they were in place. Uh, so they picked 33.5 at 26 miles distance. So when they did that, that became the highest voltage line and the longest distance line in the United States east of the Rocky Mountains. So this was the biggest project on the East Coast when they built it in 1903, 1904. So that's where this notoriety comes in that everyone keeps uh, grabbing onto. It was a very big deal when it was built because no one had done anything like this in the East Coast. <laughs> so, pretty big project here. So, like I said, building a power line in 1904 was a huge engineering problem. Now they had transformers, they had the generators, they had even lightning arresters then. That was all developed. The problem was insulation for the line. Um, insulators were kind of dragged along as the rest of this te technology outpaced them. So initially, uh, insulators in the United States were glass. They were for telephone or telegraph use, about 100 volts potential, not very high. You probably see them at flea markets, tag sales, elephant's trunk, whatever, for a buck or two. Um, very low voltage. Uh, so these projects are coming out, 2,500 volts, 10,000 volts, 20,000 volts. They're freaking out. They have no idea how to build an, or make an insulator for these uh, voltages. They don't know anything about material science, shape, design, arcing, flashover, none of this stuff. They just, let's just make bigger insulators. So initially they just took glass insulators and they made them bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until they figured out, hey, glass isn't always a good insulator. It's not strong, especially out in the elements. Kids love to throw rocks at insulators, or people shoot at them, or lightning hits them, and kaboom, no more insulator. Um, yeah, so glass, they figured out pretty quickly, isn't really a great insulator. So they switched to porcelain, or they started making porcelain insulators around 1890. Uh, but even that was a little bit shaky, because they couldn't make porcelain thicker than a half inch without it being loaded with air bubbles. So it would explode in the kiln. Um, yeah, I worked two years at Lenox, China, down in South Jersey. Um, I was a manufacturing engineer, so nowadays they'll use a vacuum, what's called a vacuum pug mill or vacuum press, and they will squeeze the air or extrude the clay out uh, under vacuum to pull the air out before they go to shape it. This is way before they figured that out. So kaboom, a lot of stuff was exploded in the kiln. So if it got out the other side, they would cement it together, glaze it, throw it out in your hair as an insulator, quick use it. <laughs> this lot, a lot of this early stuff was very unreliable. Um, in fact, uh, in the early days, they used to cement uh, porcelain insulators together. If you want something for these voltages, you need two, three, or four pieces of porcelain cemented together to get the size and the uh, shape you need for that voltage. Uh, in the early days, they uh, the first insulator for the Bay County's project was a porcelain top and a glass bottom. Uh, and they cemented together with molten sulfur. I don't know why. They put it out there, California gets a little bit warm, the current from the line warmed up the insulators, caught the sulfur on fire, and it would drop and start grass fires in California. <laughs> so that lasted about a year before they finally figured out, all right, let's try Portland cement. So then they switched to Portland cement. But like I said, they knew almost nothing. Uh, another interesting kind of sad uh, side effect of the, just shows you how little they understood about high voltage electricity. Uh, that Ames line out in Colorado and a lot of these early lines were built dead straight between the generator and the user. Dead straight, no curves, no corners, because they believed if they bent the line <laughs> to a curve, the high voltage current would fall off the wire onto the ground. <laughs> Yet they're building these things, so yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of knowledge out there. Thank God we have scientists. But anyway, um, so yeah. So these uh, insulators they're making, they don't really know what they're doing. So these voltages are going higher and higher and higher, and they flew by the seat of their pants what these things should look like. So it was very much trial and error. 
baptism by fire for the insulator industry in these early days, between 1890 and 1910. It was insane. <laughs> so, uh, another problem with glass insulators is they're very susceptible to what's called leakage current. So, um, if you picture a system, say power lines, say Edison system down in Manhattan, they ran the poles with the crossover insulators on top of the poles, the wires tied to the insulators. Uh, in a rainstorm, you know, the insulator gets wet, and if the insulator isn't designed well, what happens is the electric current starts to leak down through that wet surface into the cross arm, down the pole, and into the ground. So back in the day, 1890, 1900, there, uh, there's a lot of news headlines at the time. People would be walking down the street in a rainstorm, they'd step in a puddle next to a pole, and <laughs> or kabam, and people are electrocuted. Some of them were killed. Um, there was a news article I saw from Birmingham, England at that time. Uh, horses were being killed in the streets because of bad insulators. And over there in Europe, they used iron poles for trolleys instead of wood poles. So that made it worse. Yeah, so people at this point in time are not liking high voltage power lines at all. Want nothing to do with them. Because uh, they just do not know what they're doing yet. So, uh, in fact, a lot of these early power projects actually operate at lower voltages, like Missouri River Power. They didn't have a 50,000 volt insulator. That was very reliable. So they operated at, at 20,000 volts until the insulators came up to speed a few years later. Then they could up the voltage. Yeah, so it's very trial and error at that point in time. So yeah, insulators were the big Achilles heel in a lot of these projects. All right. <coughs> so Bulls Bridge here. This is an article. Um, just about every major electrical power project between 1880 and 1910 or 1920 was written up in extreme detail in an electrical trade journal. And there were a bunch of about eight different trade journals at the time. Um, always with a positive flow on these things. Oh, everything's great. It's going to be the best project ever. Yeah, no, 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 no problems whatsoever. So it's just funny to read these knowing what happened, especially on Bull's Bridge. Uh, so this one is about Bulls Bridge in the Electrical Review, 1903. <laughs> Rapid progress is being made on the power line over to Waterbury. So, New Milford Power, uh, going to sell electricity to Connecticut Railway and Lighting. Boom, the national news. You know, this is the biggest project on the East Coast. So, um, it says the work of contracting is going well over to Waterbury, and then they're going to extend the power line up to New Britain through Cheshire and Southington when that's done. Um, and this, this is the best part here. Um, the needed rights away for the poles and wires along the entire distance have all been secured, comma, with a few exceptions. And they were not trifles. The, those exceptions were not trifles. Uh, the few property owners who have not yet decided to sell land in Milford Power will do so shortly. <laughs> yeah, wait till I show you the lawsuits. Anyway, um, yeah. Very interestingly, the New Milford Power Company Charter of 1893 did not grant them the power to take land for the power line. Apparently it was before eminent domain was commonplace. Um, so they had to beg, borrow, and steal land off local property owners between here and Waterbury to build this power line. So you can imagine New Milford Power going across the countryside. They have to go up to farmhouses. Ah, oh, I put the podium away. Hi, we're from New Milford Power. Do you mind if we run a high voltage power line through your property? They read the headlines. What do you think the response is? Get the hell off my porch. <laughs> yeah. Very few people would sell them electricity or sell them right away for this power line. So the line actually took a lot of public right away where it needed to roads and especially rail lines. Uh, very few people would sell. So. Like I said, they did not want to get electrocuted, they didn't want their animals getting electrocuted, they didn't want their barn burning down, God knows what else is going to happen with these high voltage lines, spitting and sparking and all sorts of fun stuff, especially with bad insulators. So yeah, very rosy picture of this project when the reality was not so much. So the project had a lot of mixed feelings, local people had mixed feelings about it. Um, they had a lot of supporters, of course, because like, hey, this is the biggest project in the East Coast, highest voltage, longest distance, biggest plant. You know, we're going to get tourists, we're going to get professors and scientists showing up, studying us, you know, the economy's going to boom. This is great. Uh, but of course, you had people on the flip side of that argument. Uh, property owners, naturally, like I said, many of them just refused to sell right away to New Milford Power Company. Uh, and some of them went, took it a step further and said, no way, and called the lawyers. <coughs> 
Also, people in New Milford were just ticked off. It's like we were going to have this big, glorious power plant here, um, and all the electricity is going over to Waterbury. Because apparently, then as now, Waterbury takes, takes, takes from Litchfield County and doesn't give a lot back. <laughs> and so that set them off instantly. Um, so yeah, a lot of local anger about that. Uh, and then after that, problem, once they did build the line, it did go through. It took a very tortured route, especially through Washington. Um, it had problem after problem after problem after problem after problem after problem. The biggest project had the biggest problems. And they had a lot of lessons learned from this project and the power line in particular. Um, lots of things, insulators failing, um, mud, flood, mud slides into the canal, generators overheating, things burning up, lightning, lightning was a huge problem, uh, all sorts of fun stuff. So anyway, uh, they did build the power line. When they built it, it was built, there you are, have a seat. <laughs> Buddy of mine from Mount Fisco I haven't seen since age seven. We'll hug later when we go to dinner. Anyway, so when they built the power line, they built it in duplicate, meaning two sets of poles, each with a three-phase 33,500 volt circuit on it, uh, all the way over to Waterbury, 26 miles. Uh, they used glass insulators, that's some foreshadowing, Glass insulators and aluminum conductors, 2 watt American wire gauge aluminum cable stranded, which is about 3 8 inch diameter. So good sized cables. Uh, so they built it a duplicate. That was common practice back then, and it's still a little bit to this day. They'll have some redundancy, so if there's a problem on one line, they switch to the other line so that power is not interrupted. So that they did that over the water grid. Um, they purchased uh, glass insulators from C.S. Knowles of Boston. Now, C.S. Knowles was kind of like the Costco or Walmart of the day, turn of the century. If you wanted anything trolley, I need motors, whistle stop signs, catenary, I need arms, whatever, you called C.S. Knowles in Boston and you ordered everything out of Boston. So they called them up, said we're building a power line, they shipped glass insulators to use on it. Um, so it was predicted they were going to partially turn the line on early in 1904 to test it, and then it will be fully up and running by the summer of 1904. But, like I said, the problems commenced. So uh, when I first started researching this topic, finding out where this power line ran, uh, I contacted all sorts of local resources from Illinois, uh, the historical societies and the libraries and everyone else. And of all of those, the only one that replied was Stephen Barkus up at Gunn, which is why I gave my talk up there. Uh, but he sent me an article called Electricity in Washington. Like, awesome, oh cool, let's see this. And it turns out that article was taken from this book, An American Village, The Light at the North End of the Tunnel, which is written completely about Washington Depot. And it's very um, anecdotal, like lots of tall tales and funny stories and stuff like that, sprinkled with some facts and data. So uh, really good source. But they had the article Electricity in Washington in there, so that was a good first step for me. Um, and amongst the information in that article was this uh, interesting little gray box, uh, which apparently was an ad run in the Litchfield Inquirer uh, early in 1904. And I'm going to read it for you here. It's hard to blow these things up. Notice, all persons justly aggrieved over whose lands or lands adjoining there too, the electric lines of New Milford Power Company run, are requested to communicate promptly with W.S. Ford in Washington or Edward Van Ingen in New York. And I'll give you one guess what their occupation was. <laughs> yeah. Lawyers are involved. So we know Edward Van Ingen built Holiday House down there in what's now Steep Rock Reservation. So obviously he did not want a high voltage power line sparking across his property and it put his resort there for young wayward girls from New York. So they weren't scared of the girls any more than they are even scared of Manhattan. <laughs> so he, I'm assuming Mr. Ford is his lawyer and lawsuit number one. So he's starting a lawsuit. Uh, so after that, the line did go through. Like I said, it took a tortured route eventually, uh, but it did go through. But two months later, May of 1904, we think the line was turned on in March of 1904, as we can tell. But again, Eversource is not a great source for information. <laughs> Three zero source for information. So anyway, uh, so May of 1904, this new snippet appears in the Electrical World Trade Journal two months after the line turned out. And I'm going to read it because it's a little bit, I mean, you can't take two point fonts and blow it up real long. Well. 
Uh, so Waterbury, Connecticut, the New Milford Power Company, which transmits power from Bullsbridge to Waterbury for use by CRNL, has had in this section of line to change all of the glass insulators to porcelain insulators with much more satisfactory results. And then mentions that the line's being extended through Cheshire up to New Britain to service the trolley systems up there and they're building substations. So the line's barely on two months and kaboom, everything's exploded in service. So everyone's worries have now come true here. They're now, they're now a headline in Connecticut. So the power line didn't do too well. Um, Steve, Steve and Barkas contacted me again about four months ago. Uh, they were, they're going through scanning all their uh, documents up there. And he found this. He says, are you interested in this? And said, oh, hell yes, give this to me. So it's another lawsuit that we didn't know about. Uh, railroad wins the coal farm case. So apparently in the town of Washington, a, a local artist, well I guess what it was nationally known, Walter Russell, I don't know if that name's familiar, but apparently he was a little eccentric, but he was a sculptor and a painter and a whole bunch of this. Apparently he resided at Coal Farm in Washington. I can't find where Coal Farm was, at least on the Google machine. Uh, but I saw a source that was like on Curtis Road. So probably by the American Indian Institute, somewhere over there, which the line did run through there. Um, this guy launched a lawsuit, doesn't say when, but it was finally settled in February of 1910, and the Harvard Current published that in the newspaper because it was worthy enough. Uh, so apparently, Mr. Russell, if you read in between the lines of this, it's hysterical because apparently it sounds like he publicly threatened to cut down the power line from his property in Washington because he's sick of it. Didn't want it there, and they put it to anyway, and he was going to physically go down and cut it down. So it said he was ordered from cutting down the pole, <coughs> in part, in one sentence. Um, yeah, forbidding their removal during the lifetime of coal, a oh, former owner of the farm. All right, so he probably got sick and left. Um, but anyway, yeah, so 10 years, or almost instead of six years later, he lost his lawsuit. So at this point in time, Bulls Bridge was owned by the New Haven Railroad. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so, yeah, that was just another colorful piece of this whole story here. No one wanted this power line at all. In um, addition to this, lightning was a problem on this line. Uh, there was a, um, some minutes I found from the Institute of Electrical Engineers meeting in Milwaukee in 1906. And uh, the headliner for the conference was the, power, the chief engineer for the New Milford Power Company talking about lightning protection of early power lines. And guess which line he talked about? His line, like 18 pages of transaction notes. I'm just there reading that, it's exhausting. But they published logs, the operator logs of the line, and it looks like every two to three months there was a major lightning strike. Apparently a lot of them were in Bethlehem for some reason, uh, and took the whole line down. So the line is up and it's down, it's up and it's down, so that gets a little bit tiresome. So lightning was a huge problem. Uh, back then they had lightning arresters, what they call the lightning arrestor, about the size of a Univac computer in the 40s. They had one in the powerhouse, and they would put one in the, uh, the substation on the other end of the line. That was standard practice back then. Uh, nothing out on the line itself. So apparently after two years of this lightning problem, uh, they decided to take the radical step of taking one of these huge lightning arresters. They put it out on the line at the highest point of the line. Um, I don't know where that was. I used to think it was the top of the hill over Walker Brook, but I'm thinking now it's in Bethlehem because all these strikes happened in Bethlehem. Um, so when they did that, they became the first electric utility on the planet to use a lightning arrestor on the power line itself. So it's something we get credit for, but we don't necessarily want credit for it because it was a problem. Um, so lightning was a big problem. Uh, October 1907 found this nice headline in the Meriden Morning Record, right across the top, big black letters. Blackout. Connecticut is dark. <laughs> town of Waterbury, Nugget Valley, Cheshire, Southington, New Britain, all dark. Five major towns dark this morning because Bulls Bridge went down. One third of the state's grid went down. Uh, turns out the root cause of that was the mudslide into the canal just below the dam. Blocked the flow of water, shut down the powerhouse. So one third of the state, one third of the state went dark when that happened. Um, and then some finality. 1908, another article in the Electrical World Trade Journal that in Waterbury, they're rebuilding that steam generating plant because they're so sick of the power line being unreliable. They want to make sure the trolleys are running because they would go down, people just, they're not going anywhere on the trolleys. So anyway, very colorful history of this project, as you can see. 
Like I said, the biggest project had the biggest problems. A lot of lessons learned from this. That's just on the physical side. On the corporate side, it's just as much fun. And this is trying to get this in order um, date-wise. So much stuff was happening, it was very hard to figure out what happened first and second, and this happened because of this, and just trying to put, so I tried to clarify it as best I could, it's just very confusing to read these things. Uh, but uh, anyway, 1906, two years after the dam opened, uh, the New Haven Railroad comes snooping around. Uh, New Haven Railroad was basically owned by J.P. Morgan, the millionaire down in Manhattan, uh, through his uh, through the president, New, the New Haven Railroad president was Charles Mellon at the time, he's basically his puppet. Uh, it was no secret at that point that J.P. Morgan wanted to uh, consolidate every transportation system in southern New England under his thumb. Monopoly. His favorite word was monopoly. He, I think the quote from him was, competition is dirty. <laughs> he wanted everything under his thumb. So he sends out Charles Mellon, they start buying up everything in southern New England. So every rail line in Connecticut except one, the line, the central Vermont line that runs from New London up through Palmer, Mass, and up to Vermont. That's the only rail line in Connecticut that was not controlled by the New Haven Railroad. <laughs> so they come snooping around, they discover Connecticut Railway and Lighting. So in 1906, they, uh, they bought a controlling stock interest in CRNL, and then they uh, got a 99-year lease on the property. So apparently when they did that, along with that came New Milford Power Company. So New Haven Railroad now operates Bulls Bridge Dam and the power line and all the associated uh, utilities with that. Uh, next, New Haven Railroad purchased Housatonic Power in 1911. We don't know why. Housatonic was a paper company, had a charter, they were out of Seymour, never built anything. It was just a charter, but they bought it. So apparently that was legally interesting to them. And eventually they turned that into a holding company. Uh, under New Haven Railroad control, New Milford Power has some money, so they upgrade the plane up here. 1912, uh, that book, uh, the Bulls Bridge book here that the lady wrote, is all about that upgrade in 1912. So they added second penstock, relined the canal, added the second generator, increased from 6 megawatts to 8 megawatts. So at that point, they could finally feed New Milford, Gaylordsville, Kent. And they actually create a line, they built a line over to Pauling, New York, to sell electricity to the trolley systems over there. So that quelled a lot of the local anger at that point, because, okay, finally we get electricity from this grand glorious power plant that we helped build and never saw a watt from. So that was fixed in 1912. 1915, New Milford Power turns around and sells everything to Housatonic Power. So as we figured out through reading all these articles, apparently New Haven Railroad was using Housatonic Power as a holding company for all their utility generation. All the electric companies they owned, whether they wanted to or not, they put under whose tie power. So, um, in 1914, the year before, apparently what was left of the competition in Connecticut, filed a lawsuit in federal court, New York State Federal District Court, um, under the Sherman Antitrust Act, recently enacted. Uh, they said New Haven Railroad is a monopoly. So they filed a lawsuit, and New, the New York Federal District Court looked over the state line and said, wow, they own almost everything. Um, any town that is now Connecticut Lake Power or Eversource Connecticut, whatever they want to call themselves, was owned by the New Haven Railroad at some point. Suffield Electric up by Enfield, Danielson, Putnam, New London, the whole state they owned all these utility companies, the New Haven Railroad. It was, it was getting to be a monopoly. So the New York Federal District Court looks over and says, like, yeah, you're, you're building a monopoly over there. And they drop the axe and they make them sell off Housatonic Power. All these, all these electric assets. So that didn't happen conveniently until 1917, August 9th, 1917. Um, everything was sold to Rocky River Power Company here in New Milford, which was owned and operated by Henry Rohrbach, who became the first president of CLP. Because on that same date, when they bought everything, Henry changed the name of the company from Rocky River to Connecticut Light and Power Company. So that's the birth of Connecticut Light and Power. Uh, and he got the money to do that, again, from UGI in Philadelphia. They're throwing their shark tank, they're throwing money out. So they sensed an opportunity, so CLMP was formed on that day. <laughs> Same entity we have today. <clears throat> All right, so the chaos is mostly over. CLMP is now a state, it's, it became the, the state's largest electric utility when that happened, 1917. Mm -hmm. Uh, they go about connecting everything together. They're one of the first utilities to connect everything together and make a regional <coughs> So 
they connect Bulls Bridge to Rocky River, up through New Britain, apparently they built a line from New Britain, uh, up to the uh, Dutch Point steam plant of Hartford Electric Lights, uh, up there just south of downtown, uh, as a backup for New Britain. Um, going through all these sources, you quickly determine that New Britain had a very terrible history with CLMP. They were constant blackouts, constant brownouts. Uh, in 19, which year was it? Um, 1919 alone, the steam generating plant up there that used to be CRNLs exploded and burned down. So they lost electricity from that. And then when the CLMP, the early CLMP or uh, New Milford Power Company substations burned to the ground. So they were out of electricity most of 1919. And Stanley Works up there, the biggest employer, they got so fed up with CLMB, they turned around, they bought Farmington River Power Company, the dam up in Rainbow, because Helco would stop using them. They bought that dam, rerouted the power line in New Britain, and they took all the electricity from that dam, they divorced themselves from CLMB completely. They were that pissed off. And if you go up there today to Rainbow, It'll say right on there, Farmington River Power Company, a Stanley Works property. It's, they still own that today. <laughs> it's still a separate company. So it's an independent company. So that's, uh, yeah. Stanley Works ain't taking any gut for CLP. <laughs> About this time, I'm guessing they upgraded the power line over to Waterbury, uh, based on what I've seen along it. Uh, from what I could tell, they cut down one set of poles and they upgraded the other set. Um, so, uh, like I said, the glass failed. Pretty early on, they replaced everything with porcelain insulators from C.S. Knowles. Um, apparently, by then, that was failing, so they replaced uh, the insulators with better quality porcelain insulators around 1918 or so. Again, we don't have a record from member source, but guess, uh, I'm guessing that based on what I've seen along the line. Uh, they put in uh, better quality insulators made by Ohio Brass Company, which is still in business today. It's one of the Hubble companies, under the Hubble umbrella. Uh, and then they took the wood pins that the insulator sit on and replaced them with iron. So they really beefed up that line all the way up to Waterbury. Um, so that was done, I'm guessing, 1917, 1918 or so. So they upgraded the power line. And it lasted, I'm guessing this line in its original alignment lasted until around 1930. And again, we have no records from our source to prove this. I'm just doing it based on what I've been able to find. I'm going to shut up at this point. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Enzo? Enzo or Jason? What's that? Any of this published anywhere? Um, the video of this is on the Gun Museum website, our Facebook page. Uh, this is being videotaped here, uh, I think for local public access television, so God willing, uh, some celebrity in the hills out here is watching me right now. <laughs> Meryl Street, maybe in Bridgewater, I don't know. Hi, Meryl. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, this is being videotaped. Uh, we do have the slides. The, the library has a copy of the slides, but I need to send an updated copy as well. So, yeah. Anyway, any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for coming.